Okay, I'm going to go ahead and welcome us, um, and people will continue to join in as they may. Um, we are so honored and grateful to have three incredible artists with us to talk. Um, before we do anything, my name is Daniela from Rattlestick, and I want to take a moment to acknowledge that we are hosted by Rattlestick Playwrights Theater, whose physical space stands on the unceded lands of the Lenape people. We recognize that in countless places in the world, Native peoples were abused, murdered, and forcibly removed from their lands by ideals and actions of land discovery and settler colonization. We recognize and respect all of the Native peoples all over the world and invite every individual in this event to investigate the history of the land on which they stand and their Native peoples. Colonization is an ongoing process that still harms and destroys lives and cultures. Let us honor, respect, and hold the open door and open space for all Native peoples, past, present, and future. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonism. So thank you so much for being in this space. If anyone wants to share what lands they are on, go ahead and please add that to the chat. Um, this lockdown panel is being hosted by Rattlestick Playwrights Theater and WP Theater. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, uh, last night we shared uh, the reading of Corey Thomas's lockdown, and it will be available for anyone to see until the 7th. So if you haven't seen it, please be sure to tune in. And it is an incredible piece of work, and we are honored to be chatting with all of you right now. So, um, first and foremost, um, we want to welcome the panelists and artists and have them introduce themselves and what their connection is to Corey and to Lockdown and all of that jazz. So we'll start with Corey. What's your connection to Corey and Lockdown, Corey? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm Corey and I happen to write Lockdown. So that's my connection. And um, for those of you who haven't um, seen it quite yet, or, or well, actually we'll get into the origin of it. So let's, let's ping on over to James. I'm James, a fellow writer and who uh, met Corey a number of years ago um, and am in community with her and a number of people who were um, really instrumental in, in, in the themes and, and characters that came out of lockdown. Great. Thank you, James and Robbie. Hi, I'm, I'm Robbie Pollock. Uh, I am connected to Corey through the first uh, showing of the lockdown play at Rattlestick Theater. I uh, participated as a community partner and a um, speaker in the talkbacks. Um, I'm now a Rattlestick Advisory Board member. Um, and yeah, that's my connection. Great, and we can make sure to share full bios of these wonderful artists in the chat for you, which we can do. Um, thank you, Kaz. So I asked the artist to go ahead and actually, first and foremost, share a piece of writing. Um, so I actually just sprung that on them <laughs> about 10 minutes ago. So um, I... Uh, this is the moment where they're going to share a piece of writing, which will also demonstrate their connection to what lockdown is all about. Um, Corey, can we start with you? Okay, so I uh, just quickly printed out a page from lockdown. And uh, it comes from the very first scene where Ernie, the female character meets Wise, the male character, um, the whole the whole point of their meeting is she's a volunteer and he's asked her to help him write his statement, his impact statement for his uh, upcoming parole board hearing. So I'm just going to um, read that little bit. Um, he says, and he's explaining, she's, she doesn't quite understand why he wants her to help him do it. So he says, 
I've helped a lot of people with writing their impact statements for the parole board, and some of them have been found suitable and are out there living free now. I've been here a long time, Ernie. I was 16 when I got off the gray goose and they give me my fish kit. I ain't even start shaving yet. First time, my celly keeps saying, you going against the grain. I didn't know what he was talking about. He had to show me how to hold the razor. And here I am, 62 years old, and they think I'm still that same person, don't know how to hold a razor. So I think, you know, for all people, of all people, I should be able to do it for myself by now. It's a short speech explaining that I've done everything in my power to make amends for the crime I committed. I ain't never asked nobody for no help with mine before, but if you could help that statement for me, I think it would make a difference. So then Ernie says, I'm not understanding why you can't write this yourself. And he says, yes, you're right. I should be able to. For instance, I know more about causative factors than most people. I know about more about it than I know more about all of it than most people. But I just can't never seem to get it right when I'm doing it for myself. I committed a crime. Judge sent me to the pen to do time. Fine. OK, I done it. But you find yourself in here. They don't never want to give you a chance to leave. And I deserve a chance. I deserve the chance to have a chance. We all do. I ain't never claimed that I didn't do what I've done, but I want for them to see that there's more to me than just that one cold act. And I can't never seem to find the words. Can you help me find the words to show those people the inside of myself so that they can understand and respect me? Like what you did for the refrigerator man, because truth be told, he sounded like a joker when I first started reading and you changed my mind. I need to change their minds. So thank you for sharing that, Corey. And I think it would be great, actually, for James and Robbie, if you could talk about, like, as you listen to what Corey just shared, like, how's that resonant for you? How does that, how does that speak to both of you? For me, it's it, it's a it's a story I, I've heard and seen countless times of a person who can um, help others get to their truth, but for whatever reason is not able to make the connections in a way that that makes the parole board feel comfortable with their release, their own um, release, and and it also like highlights the frustration, which a lot of incarcerated people can't name, of having to come up with some short pithy statement that, that clearly shows their insight while their decades of, of living um, humble, clean, prosperous lives goes undervalued. Yeah, I, I, I second that entirely. There's also something tremendously strange about having the entire outcome of your life rest in a panel of other people's hands. Um, there's no, there's no um, coincidence that many movies and uh, dramas end with a courtroom scene where there's a jury and everything rests on the ability to kind of convey a truth and judge that in a context. So I thought I was free of that um, process. I had a short bid and uh, I knew a lot of people who were facing life parole. And I was like, I was like, oh, you know, I feel you. It sucks. But, and then I realized I had my own board to go to. And I was like, oh, this is hard. Um, and I remember the first time I wrote to someone on paper asking them to write a letter on my behalf for the board. And uh, I couldn't get the pen to work. I didn't know how to ask someone for me. Like I would have glad, I would have written a hundred letters for someone else, but I, I couldn't do it. Uh, and I'm still grateful to the people who wrote. So that, that's what it makes me think of Corey, just how hard it was. Uh, but also that the other thing about parole that's really interesting is that those courtroom dramas happen in the public and the dramas that are taking place for 
millions of people inside prison are happening behind closed doors. No one ever gets to see it. This is one of the few representations on the stage ever of this drama that uh, impacts millions of people, families, and, and so forth. Um, this is the first time we've seen it in this play, Lockdown, uh, portrayed in such a big way. And I, I think it's really important to break that, you know, bring law and order to prison, I guess, in a sort of way. So uh, anyway, those are my thoughts. And Corey, can you just give us a context for where all of this came from? Like where the play came from for you? And um, let, let's just go there. Yeah, I can, the genesis of the play um, is that I went, I found myself in San Quentin prison uh, because I was uh, working with two podcast producers. Uh, I was hired to write the narration for this podcast that ended up not even happening, but um, I had never been in a prison before. Um, and so I, I had low expectations walking in the door and the people that I met totally, uh, you know, bashed my low expectations, exceeded any expectation, uh, you know, you know, multi, multi fold so many times. And I was very ashamed of having walked in with low expectations because I'm a fairly worldly person. I'm well read, I'm open. And so I wondered where did that come from? Why did I walk in those gates expecting the worst of the people I was about to meet? And I realized that it's really the images that we see out there. And so because I, I the only tools I have at my disposal are that I'm a writer. I decided I wanted to write something because I was like, if I'm this wrong, other people must be wrong, must have this, Im you know, this, this image of people as well. So that was my first, you know, initial gut reaction was I want to correct this, this wrong and almost do penance for myself for feeling this way. Um, but then, you know, I started, I, it, things transpired and I started volunteering in the prison. I started working with a man named Lonnie Morris, who has, is in his 45th year of incarceration now. He's 69 years old. And I first had begun writing a really bad play. So I was telling him about it and he's like, that's a bad play. <laughs> so basically he said, I don't know why people don't ever write plays about people like me. And I said, oh, because you're not dramatic enough. That's why. And you know, he's like, no, I'm dramatic. And so I said, okay, tell me about yourself. And he started telling me about himself and I suddenly realized he's right. He's actually right. People should start writing about people like Lonnie. Um, and so I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to erase this terrible play I've started writing and I'm going to write about you instead. And he said, well, you can't do that. You're not allowed to write about me. And I said, well, suppose I kind of write about you, but I don't say it's about you. And so he said, well, I mean, I guess it, you could do that. So, I mean, what I decided to do was write a play sort of inspired by him. Um, it's not about him per se, but it's very much inspired by him. And at this point, I'd become sort of entrenched um, there. I've met so many people who had become very, I'd become so fond of and become very special to me and gotten to know. And it really became a work of trying to honor all of the people that I'd met there to the best of my ability and to share what I have come to know. Um, because I see that media in general shows one extreme or the other. You usually see wrongfully convicted people or you see monsters. You know, you don't see the, the bulk of the people who are incarcerated, which is someone who maybe did do something at some point and has totally worked past that point. You don't see rehabilitated people who change. And so I just really wanted to kind of show that because I was seeing it so evidently in front of myself, people who change, people who have changed and are stuck there somehow. And that's what I wanted to try to express because there's millions of stories that can be written about incarceration and prison. I mean, and I feel like there's so many people better equipped than me who have lived experience who should be writing those things. But, and because I realized I don't, I don't know it in that kind of organic way because I haven't gone through the experience myself. I mean, I know more about it than many other people do because I've spent so much time there, but I don't know lived experience to, to say I'm an authority on this subject. 
um, which is why I therefore asked people there, especially Lonnie, but others to really help me. I said, I want to write this play and I want it to be authentic and I want it to be accurate. And so, you know, everyone just sort of jumped in to help me. I asked people questions, you know, all the time. I was following people with notebooks to, um, Erlon was giving me like vocabulary lessons in prison slang. You know, I mean, it really, every, it became like a, a labor of love. And I kind of feel like everyone's DNA runs through the play at this point, because there's little bits of everyone embedded in there. So, I mean, it was funny because James, when um, I, I was able to bring a video of the play to show it so that we could all watch it together and James was there and James like got all of the people who were wise, who the main character wise is based on, he got it. I mean, so that was like really cool. <laughs> so anyway. And also like the show art, you know, you, yes. also, you got that from an artist. Banks, that yeah. Banks did the did the poster for me. Um, David Jossi uh, did, you know, let me use his song, but also the rap that I wrote in the song. I thought, you know, I wrote a terrible rap that I showed him and he said, this looks like an OG from the 80s wrote it. And I'm like, well, I mean, I'm not a, I don't know how to write a rap. And so can, I was thinking like he would say, okay, I'll write one for you. And he was like, you can do it yourself. And I'm like, what? And he said, no, listen to the same music the youngsters listen to and you can do it yourself. And I was like, oh my God. And I literally spent an entire night awake listening to like Mozzie and all these people. And I, and I like just copied the rhythm of the line and put my own words to the rhythm. And then I brought it in and he's like, okay, you see, I knew you could do, you know, it was that kind of thing, but he made me do it myself. So I'm probably the most proud of my rap actually, because um, I did not think I could do something like that. So, you know, but it really became a thing where everyone was sort of supporting me. Everyone was so excited when the play was coming out and it was the most amazing experience to watch it with everyone there that day. So, you know, anyway. Thank you for sharing all of that, Corey. Um, so, uh, we were speaking of lived experience and speaking about lived experience and writing about lived experience. James, um, I'd love to throw it over to you to um, share some writing and talk about what today is. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just uh, let the writing speak for itself. I, I think you'll pick up what today is. Um, today, December 4th, it's the first anniversary of my release from prison. I don't know quite how to articulate this, but getting out of prison is a complicated experience. One moment, you're in near total captivity. The next, you're free. It's a cause for celebration, gratitude for the many small blessings in life, like being able to close a door before using the bathroom. But also, imagine it's your first day working at a bank. Near closing, people with guns come in and take you and your coworkers hostage. The hours drag by and gradually, without notice really, a commonality is forced upon you and your peers. When one of your coworkers slightly hunches their shoulders, you recognize it as an attempt to relieve the stiffness that comes from sitting uncomfortably in one position too long. You all recognize the anxiety that comes with wondering when your captors will feed you, when you'll get a drink of water, when you can stand without drawing the suspicion of the armed person feet away from you when you'll be able to use the bathroom, and when you'll be able to leave. After hours, perhaps days, one captor points at you, tells you that you alone are free to leave. Your first impulse is joy, followed swiftly with, but what about the others? My overriding emotion remains gratitude. I feel incredibly fortunate to sit here, Spotify playing in the background, typing about my release, and reflecting on this year in my life. I made it out three months before the greatest public health crisis we've seen since HIV. In spite of the shelter in place, I've been fortunate to enjoy largely virtual hangouts with family and friends in ways I could have never imagined after years of having my ability to connect with people policed. I've also watched with mostly amusement as people who are not incarcerated have referred to this as a lockdown. Sure, and people who play the game of football use war rhetoric. This year, which has felt so restrictive for most of society, 
has been a year in which I've experienced greater options than any of the 250,000 people in captivity in California. That doesn't mean COVID fatigue isn't real, but I can't compare my first year of release with my incarcerated loved ones who are scared for their lives in the same way any of us would be if we'd been trapped in overcrowded, unventilated space with no ability to physically distance. Wear a mask, they say. What, even when we sleep? Thank you so much for sharing that, James. So powerful. Um, Corey and Robbie, I want to sort of give you space to respond to what resonated for you just now from what James wrote. Well, for me, so many things. I mean, because at this point, I have known a lot of people who have been released. So that's the first thing is that just that, that, that complicated experience that I've come to know that a person who's released goes through um, learning the world again, and also thinking about what it must be to learn the world when it's under these circumstances where you're so restricted um, in a different kind of a way, but also, um, you know, just the knowing that you're free, that, that having to remind yourself over and over, I'm free, that you can listen to Spotify and type and do what you want and wear what you want and all of those things. I mean, that's just so, so that's an experience that most of us will never have to have. And so that's, um, you know, that's resonating with me, but also just this terrible public health crisis. I mean, I think the entire month of June, I didn't sleep the whole month. I don't think I've ever cried that much as I did because I was so worried and panicked about the people. I know I was texting James sometimes and other people. It was just, and I, and I, as horrible as I felt, I couldn't even imagine what it felt for the people who had just been there with people because that's like literally knowing that your family is you know, locked in a place in unsafe, um, circum unhygienic circumstances. And so, you know, I, I knew that what I felt was like multiplied tenfold by the people who had actually been incarcerated and were now not incarcerated. So um, I really was feeling for the people who had, had been released, who had left, you know, so many friends behind. So Anyway, those are the first things that, that resonated. It reminded me of, of, and even still, this health crisis continues because there's now a new whole bunch of people who are getting sick right now. And there are other prisons now going through the same horrible experience that, that San Quentin did in June and July. And so um, it's just a real situation that's, that's devastating in this country. Robbie, do you want to jump in here too? Yeah, I mean, we've been living it. Thank you, James. Uh, just powerful writing, um, compact, tight, laser beam to the forehead kind of thing. Uh, I dig it a lot. It reminds me, I mean, I work at PEN America's prison writing program and uh, for the last several months, we've been issuing a our temperature check series, which kind of feels bad because it's kind of like a pun about it during a pandemic and puns during a pandemic are awful, just, just to be clear. Um, that's a joke, but it's not a joke too. Um, so you can check it out at pen.org slash works of justice. Um, as part of this series, we've had lots of writing from our writers who are inside. They're amazing writers, stunning writers from all over the country relating their experiences during the pandemic. So I just thought of um, a buddy of mine, Mo Mansuri, who weirdly I interviewed for NPR's Hunker Down Diaries and on Radio Diaries. And um, he described um, at Sing Sing Correctional Facility, not far from New York, um, the experience of trying to stay safe in a cell. He said he invented something called a cell mask. Well, I, I guess I named it cell mask, but it, he put a blanket with a sheet and another layer of blanket across his bars with a fan blowing from the back of his cell. And 
violently threatening anyone who came within proximity of his cell that didn't have a mask on in order to just try to remain safe while in his cell. And that doesn't cover getting on the phone, going to the mess hall. This thing is so serious inside prisons and we're seeing spikes all over the place. It really is a big deal. Um, I also like the comparison that James, that you made with this word lockdown and the extension of language used rhetorically um, both how dangerous and it brings us closer and it also highlights differences. So I feel like people during the coronavirus lockdown have gotten a little bit of an understanding about what it feels like to be separate from loved ones. When, you know, people haven't been able to be at the bedside of people they care about when they die. You know, my grandmother died when I was in prison and I didn't get to go see her. And I know there are people outside who now share a very similar emotional experience to not being allowed. You have a elderly family member and you go wave outside their window. People all over the world have now experienced this thing. So there's something to be said about the similarities and the room for compassion that it opens. And that's what I think of too, when I hear your piece, um, because football players talk about, use war, war metaphors. And it's because there's a difficulty in getting your head smashed in day out after day and operating at peak physical fitness and you know facing injury and risk. So while it's not the same, I think we do have grounds to understand each other, prisoners and non-prisoners. You know, we're we're kind of in the same realm where rhetoric can apply to both. Both terminology can apply to both. Um, I think that's interesting. Um, and James, you were you've been writing um, for a long time, or can you sort of talk about your writing and? and how your writing has shifted from when you were writing from the inside and now writing on the outside. And Oh, yes. And thank you for that question. I, I, um, I think I really started leaning back into my writing in 2016. Like I'd grown up writing, wrote for the high school newspaper all four years, but just over the course of life had gotten away from just that that joy of, of thinking things through, writing, refining, um, the process that Corey spoke about, about getting feedback on your thoughts and making it really like a village piece. Like it, it's, I've probably never written anything in my life, but I'm really skilled at like disseminating others' thoughts and, and, and um, hopefully capturing the, the nuances behind them. Um, and in 2016, I, I, um, I wrote an op-ed which was related to a ballot initiative that had passed in, in California. It was called Prop 57. Um, and it wound up being published. And after that, a friend of mine who had a, a nonprofit invited me to start writing a weekly blog for their um, website. So for the next three years or so, I wrote weekly um, a first person perspective on what it meant to be um, incarcerated. And you asked the question how my, my writing has changed. Um, you know, though no one was looking over my shoulder as I was writing all of those years, I was very much self censoring because I was in a cocoon of state violence. And I knew that at some point my writing would be used to um, determine whether or not I was suitable for release. Um, I knew that that my writing would be vetted just for that purpose. And it was. Um, when I went to my parole board hearing, the commissioner brought up things that I'd written and fortunately um, liked them um, or else I wouldn't be sitting here today. Um, Post-release, I was able to say something that I said in the piece that I shared with you all today that incarceration is actually captivity. Um, I, I like, I think a lot about metaphor and like to, to um, play the devil's advocate with Robbie, I, I would argue that, that like there's something intrinsically different 
from doing the responsible thing, which is like choosing to not go um, be at your, your, your loved one's um, side because of the, the pandemic we're in with being violently forced to comply because there's an armed person there who will, who has charge over your body um, in a way that none of us are out here are experiencing. So I, I think that um, metaphors can be useful shorthand, but they're always reductive. And um, sometimes when we lean too far into them, we miss the reductions and um, actually think we're empathizing or finding commonality when we're actually missing the bigger differences. So I, I think that, that um, my writing out here, I've been able to explore um, what feels like more authentic and blunter metaphors than I felt safe to do while incarcerated. Thank you for, for sharing all of that and all of your perspective. And there's sort of a bunch of different things that are being talked about that I think we'll be able to circle back on. And I wanna say to the folks that are listening, um, if you've got specific questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll make sure to save time for your questions, comments and responses too. Um, so uh, thank you, James, and it's wonderful to hear your writing and um, get to know more of your writing as well. Um, so Robbie, um, you are also a writer um, and I wanna create a moment for you to share your writing with everybody here as well. All right, let's do this. Um, James, I love the contrast of our opinions and I think it's perfect that it comes together over a discussion of lockdown, which kind of encapsulates many different viewpoints in the narrative. Um, so I'm happy to share my weird, slightly different perspective um, with total respect. Um, this piece is about uh, my first job after being released on parole four years ago. Um, here we go. I'm that guy. Sweaty with a large bundle of packages smushing you into the corner of the elevator. I'm also brown with a large unkempt afro. And I wanna say, hello, how are you today? There are times in this elevator when the tension is so thick that I want to scream. I wanna make it everyone else's fault. I stand there, hot, grumpy, sometimes soaking wet. And it's clear to me that this Christie's employee in her Lord and Taylor outfit with crispy pearls can't look at me because she does not see me as a person. This banker type with his banker type uniform can't glance my way because I represent some invisible form of underclass. I'm challenged by the difficulty unpacking what animus I perceive is real and how much is my projection. But I'm discovering the power inherent in the piece of this interaction I can control my response to what I think people think of me. Most of the time since I've been training myself, I'm able to say something. I say, what's up? Or, woo, it's hot, isn't it? Or cold, or thank goodness it's Friday, or some similar conversational lubricant. But it's embarrassing how often I'm surprised by the warmth, the quickness, the gap between classes, perceptions, social isolation, and my own predictions are bridged. I've had hundreds, maybe thousands of these interactions in my year and a half as a bike messenger in the city. The hard to admit terror I feel moments before I say something is something I've learned to identify. My entire vision of myself is on the line as I interact with the world. The easy antidote to this terror is to hate the external thing I think is causing it. Sorry, old black lady who looks like my mom. Your New York defenses that tell you not to acknowledge my presence makes my fragile ego want to hate you. Put any other demographic in that elevator. My fear plus their normal self-containment equals horrible levels of emotional discomfort and unfair narratives that my mind holds up as reality. But my mind is wrong. One white banker guy and I rode up 23 floors I have a bias against banker types, pretty much against the whole capitalist machine, but that's a different article. 
I looked at the smug sneer on his face and his indifference to my presence. And around the fifth floor, I tried the technique. I said, I know this is weird, but I like to talk to people in elevators because it makes me feel more comfortable. He laughed and said he understood. I asked him how he was doing. He told me he'd had a lump on his neck that he thought would go away, but didn't. Then I noticed the taped bandage peeking just above his tight shirt collar. He said the doctors took it out, but he was still worried it might be cancerous. I told him that I hope he would be all right and that it was brave for him to talk about it. I sincerely wished him a good day and he enthusiastically wished me one too. I spent the rest of the day riding around shrouded in the warmth of that human connection. So powerful to hear the human connection. So powerful to hear that moment. Um, thoughts, things that came up for both of you, Corey and James, while you heard what Robbie had to share. I guess just the humanity and the surprise of how we, we have a tendency a lot of the time to judge people um, before, before, you know, without giving them the chance to, to show us who they actually are. I mean, I know I'm guilty of it many times. I think I've written three plays now because of this and, you know, as penance for making some judgment and then feeling bad about it and like punishing myself by now having to write a play as an act of public penance. So, I mean, lockdown is one of them, um, is a prime example. So that's, I think what I'm thinking of how we, you know, live through the world with so many people and we don't know who they are. And I think all my plays are sort of about that on some level or another also, you know? So anyway, that's what came to my head, just humanity and people and how we don't know what a person is going through and what they've gone through. And, you know, if we connect it to incarceration, how we don't have a tendency, the public doesn't see people who are incarcerated as individuals um, and how that's something that I think I walked in the gates not doing and totally um, have, have can't not do that now <laughs> at this point because I've come to know so many people. And, you know, so anyway. Oh, this is a really wonderful piece of writing. And there's there's just so much here I'd love to unpack. And I'll just start with, I just love the beginning. I'm that guy. It, it's quasi bro-ish in, in a way that makes you think it's going one place and it actually goes somewhere else in a way that I think is really interesting. And, and I mean, I, I really just like this concept of um, feeling judged while also judging, like people are seeing me as an underclass and I'm judging the banker types. Um, and, and just how like um, the realization of that, that comes across. Um, and I also really like the, this idea that, that I think doesn't get named enough of how we use people who we can't quite read as mirrors or self-reflections like how we like actually assume something on them, which is just actually was all in our head the entire time. Like in that piece at the beginning, you said you represent some invisible form of underclass. No one had spoken a word, it was just you, like in conversation with yourself. And so um, I just like how that comes out as well, just as a reminder that, that we, um, we all do that. Thank you for sharing. So um, what, do, what do we do to find a way to prioritize the humanity of those who have lived experience in the criminal justice system for those who are incarcerated? You know, how do... Um, the folks who are listening here to this conversation or listening on Facebook or will listen to this conversation tomorrow or the next day or weeks from now, how, what does activism now mean 
it feels pretty urgent. You all talked about COVID, the impact of COVID on those who are inside of prisons, and then the urgency of how we're dealing with one another inside of, outside of um, the prison system, on the street, in the elevator, day to day, in big ways and small ways. What do we do to prioritize humanity, protect one another in this very urgent time? Um, I guess the first thing that pops in my head, Daniela, and I think it's a great question, like, what can we do? No one asked it in the chat, but I know you're thinking it. Um, I guess the first aspect I, is listening. Uh, we are, Brian Stevenson says, we are fundamentally changed by proximity to the problem, right? So. As soon as I hear the story about the Syrian refugee, all of a sudden I am now closer in proximity to the challenges and problems faced. I mean, people have changed their lives and devoted themselves to major activism and advocacy uh, because they became proximate. Um, either they had handcuffs put on them for the first time or like, an old man in Buffalo got pushed over by the cops when walking away too slow. Um, and, you know, that's proximity. Uh, so listening is a great way of doing it. And then I guess the next question someone would have about listening would be, well, where, you know, cause you know, you could watch Lester Holt and Dateline maybe, um, but where do I, find art and, and music and, and writing written by people who are inside. And the fact is that it's really hard. Um, uh, Penn and a bunch of other programs that I'm involved with are recipients of a wonderful fund called the Art for Justice Fund. Um, it's like artforjusticefund.org. Uh, it's a great hub of many, many different spokes of art, it includes writing, uh, drama, lots of other works. Um, and it's a great place to find a bunch of different places that would that would suit your need. And I guarantee you'll not be disappointed um, by any stretch of the imagination. And people who are behind bars represent every slice of society. I have the advantage as Penn's prison writing program manager to hear from men, women, white, black, Latinx, gay, straight, queer, all kinds of people from all around the country who share their stories and they're all up in the prison writing section of the of, of Penn's archives. We've been going back 30 years. Um, so you can always check it out there and just realize that people just because you cross a barrier into some weird hostage situation using James's uh, metaphor, they don't become less human. They were just in the street. And in a second, they could be back out in the street, the same people that were labeling and categorizing you there they're the people next to you in the grocery store they're you know everyone uh uh we've turned our society into a prison um and so yeah listening and then informing yourself uh i think that's probably i'll leave that to other speakers to talk about how to how to actually take part and do something I'll weigh in and, and thank you also for the question. And, and in a moment, if you all see me pull my soapbox out and stand on it, think nothing of it. Um, I, I think that the, like one of the, the phrases that has really gotten under my skin in the last year is, or the concept is this concept of humanizing people. Um, we're all inherently human. And I like to joke that, that um, my parents humanized me, no one else <laughs> can. Uh, um, but but what we can do, and, and I think that that Brian Stevenson and Robbie like are are absolutely correct in saying like proximity is essential for understanding complex people and, and social dynamics. And I also think that it takes a commitment to do more than than be proximate. Um, in, in that during my, my six and a half years of incarceration, the people who were most proximate to me were the prison guards. Um, and 
they often became desensitized to the violence I was experiencing as opposed to more empathetic. And so why is it that just their proximity did not then create bonds that, that caused them to take issue with using violence against me? It's because something more than proximity is also required. And I, I think that um, at the very beginning of this conversation, Corey talked about an experience that I saw play out hundreds, if not thousands of times during my thousands or, or my six years of San Quentin. Um, San Quentin pre-pandemic was a, was a prison that had tours every day. And you'd see, you know, dozens of people come in and it would be their first time in a prison environment and the light bulb would go on. It's like, oh, wow, you guys can hold can speak in complete sentences and you're so articulate and this is like incredible and, and like you're talented and you're like, you remind me of me and this person that I knew over there and just how enlightening that experience was. Um, but the step beyond it that, that, um, that Corey took and, and that we all should take is to start to learn from the, the people in there. Um, one thing that Corey doesn't mention is that when she goes into the prison, she is protected by the, the system there and the status quo. So when David Jassy says, no, you write the, the poem, you, you write the rap yourself, in small ways, that's an act of courage because of the power dynamic. And so, but her willingness to mitigate the power dynamic by building real and genuine bonds is the step that we need to take in order to move beyond mere proximity into relationship. Um, and, and I think that that going forward, like, you know, if you want to know and, and understand criminal justice, talk to the people who are most directly impacted, but don't just talk to them and use them for their experiences. Also understand their thinking, also listen to the strategies, allow them to teach you the lessons that they're learning and allow them to reimagine the new world to come. It, it's, you know, I, I strongly believe that people who have, who are benefiting from this current system, it falls on them to dismantle it. People who are impacted by this current system should be given the gift of imagining the world to come and creating it. And we should follow their lead. And I'll pause there, put my soapbox away. Robbie, did you want to jump in? Because I could, I could tell you might want to there. It's like, damn, James King, just, just talk all the time. These headphones exist for you now. They, that's all I want in here. Um, no, so well said. Um, we, <laughs> we have a saying that we've, we've coined, and I use it pretty much in all the work, and it addresses one of the central tenets of philanthropy and do-gooderism that people often take, uh, which is like, oh, I want to help. I want to, I want to do something to help. And it's a, it, it, it gets complex, but the fundamental thing is that we like to approach our work through a connective lens rather than a charitable lens, because the flip side of charity is, uh, oh, they're poor and they need my help or they're a monster and they don't deserve my help, right? So if, if I can turn it on the spigot, I can turn off the spigot. Understanding our absolute intertwined relationship uh, that poor neighborhoods are wrapped up in the success of rich neighborhoods because we have to have sustainable larger systems and that you know, violence is a symptom of larger societal forces and all of these things that Corey, again, Corey's play happens to capture a lot of this wisdom in a way that is not uh, pedantic, uh, but uh, shows and doesn't tell. Um, the, I think of the scene where uh, Wise talks about his crime and Crime is one of those really weird things that polarizes people, right? If you did something wrong, now you are in a in a bucket, good or bad. And I cannot want to help a bad person because helping a bad person might make me a bad person. 
And this is this is a fundamental challenge that that comes with language. I don't want to digress too much, but I do want to say that in order for us, in order for many people to make the step to take action, you definitely need the first step, step of listening and you definitely need the second step of relationship. But what happens in relationship is the very challenging thing of realizing that I am the worst of all of us. I am a school shooter. I am someone who takes advantage of people. I am someone who has caused harm. And that, I, I, I keep making myself unpopular with this very particular point um, that if I can't be, take responsibility for an, a jerk of a cop pushing an old man down and, and I am him, I pay his salary. And so like I, my taxes, fund the structures that thing my 401k has uh private prison profits propping up my retirement i have to recognize that literally i am a part of all the systems of oppression and not feel devastated by that but feel driven into action that's my response to james king i'll drop the mic as if that even pales in comparison it's it's so powerful, though, talking about the human connection, the intertwining um, on the micro and the macro level. So I feel like, Robbie, you just went macro on systemic connection um, and impact. Um, as James, you went micro, like the impact of change on a, on a very individual level is, is the listening, but really feeling invested in the human relationship, much like is demonstrated in Corey's play. Um, in the elevator that we just heard you write about, Robbie. Um, so we have a question from Christine, so I'm going to invite her to unmike herself and ask her question. Okay, so um, maybe uh, more on the micro level, I am so interested in the tension that um, was definitely in the, the scene from the play that you read, Corey, definitely what you described, Robbie, the tension about you deciding how much truth, how to tell the story, what, what, what version, what, are you telling it for you? Or are you telling it for the audience? And I, and I think, I mean, you described the tension that Robbie, you said was like almost a paralysis. Um, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm interested in what you go through internally when you decide which version of truth or what thread of truth you're going to put out there and, and be heard and be seen and what the, how you, how you anticipate the gaze and the ears. I know I just spoke, but I, I want to just presence in the room. James, I think you gave us a great gift when you talked about the situational context and here's where I'm like putting my foot down. There's a total difference between being compelled to tell a story for your freedom mm. and safety and just telling a story because you wanna like, I don't know, get a better job or, you know, make some money. Like there's been many situations in my life and I, I actually count them among my most traumatic uh, I remember uh, I had a string of arrests uh, and I was let out of the tombs in Southern Manhattan and um, <laughs> I had forgot, they give you a Metro card when you get out so you can get on the train and get home. Um, and it was like for some, a traffic stop that, that I got, spent a weekend in, in, in jail. I got to the train station, realized I didn't have a card and there's a transit cop there and I was like, hey, um, I have no way of getting home. I don't want to hop the turnstile. I literally just got out of jail. He's like, oh, you just got out of jail? Um, he's like, well, are you a citizen? And I was like, yeah, I was born here, man. What are you talking about? I'm American. He's like, all right, we'll sing the national anthem. And uh, on the street in West Fort Street in the village, um, I stood and it almost brings tears to my eyes. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna sing the goddamn national anthem right the freak now. And that was my story at that moment. And I, I sang it 
with the absence of irony. <laughs> uh, I got on the train though. Um, I just want to quickly share that Lonnie called from from uh, from San Quentin and was on speaker and heard a lot of this and his 15 minutes were up so he had to go but he was like told me to tell everyone that he really enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> Christina, I, I think that that like during my incarceration for my own sanity I had to hold both of those stories. I had to hold the story that, that was true to me and the one I knew they wanted to hear. And, and the one that, that I knew they wanted to hear was bad people do bad things. Um, going back to Robbie's point, we are not what we do. Um, there is harm that happens that is not um, criminalized. And then there's harm that happens that is criminalized and people decide that. And so understanding that every person who's ever lived has committed harm and been harmed um, and me knowing and unpacking the harms that I had caused and the harms that I had received in order to begin the process of healing um, was very important for myself. At the same time, when I went into the parole board, they didn't want to hear about harms I'd received. There was no poor me that was going to happen. I had to go in and just talk about the um, compartmentalize the harms that I had caused. And I had to internalize to a degree the narrative that bad people do bad things. Um, San Quentin, they, they, they have a counter to that that hurt people hurt people and healed people heal people. Um, and so I had to lean into that that trope in order to um, fit into the narrative that the parole board was comfortable with because um, the unfamiliar, any unfamiliar is seen as a threat or dangerous or let's give you another three years in prison so we can analyze what you said and, and see if we fit, can feel comfortable with it. Um, thank you for um, asking that question, Christine. Thank you for the three of you living in this really open and vulnerable place with us today. Um, we are, uh, I feel personally just richer for having heard your stories, your experiences, your journey. Um, and we invite all of you to, if you haven't seen um, Lockdown yet, you still can. You can go to the Women's Project Theater, um, WP Theater, or you can go to Rattlestick um, website and get a link to RSVP. It's free. We really want you to share it with your loved ones. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a play that for all the times I've seen it, and I've seen it quite a lot, it keeps surprising um, me in a way. And I think it's just because it's so honest and rich about the human experience. Um, so very grateful to the, to the three of you on behalf of Rattlestick and Women's Project. We just wanna say thank you for your time, your energy, your heart, and for all of you listening do what you can to move the needle, to prioritize the humanity of those that are in your orbit and those who are very far out of your orbit so that we can together make things um, better for all of us. So thank you. Thank you so much.